natural selection. It is the differential success of individuals within the population that results from their interaction with their environment. As outlined by Charles Darwin, natural selection is a product of two conditions. First, is that variation occurs among individuals within a population in some heritable characteristics. Second, that this variation results in differences among individuals in their survival and reproduction as a result of their interaction with the environment. The fitness of an individual is measured by the proportionate contribution it makes to future generations. Under a given set of environmental conditions, individuals having certain characteristics that enable them to survive and reproduce are selected, and eventually passing those characteristics on the next generation. An adaptation is any heritable behavioral, morphological, or physiological trait of an organism that has evolved over a period of time with the process of natural selection, such that it maintains or increases the fitness of an organism under a given set of environmental conditions. The root of all similarities and differences among organisms is the information contained within the molecules of DNA. A gene is a stretch of DNA coding for a functional product. Also, the alternate forms of a gene are called alleles. The pair of alleles present at a given locus defines the genotype of an individual. When both alleles are the same, the individual is said to be homozygous, and when the alleles are different with each other, it is said to be heterozygous. In the case in which one allele masks the expression of the other, the allele that is expressed is referred to as the dominant allele, whereas the allele that is masked is called the recessive allele. If the allele is recessive, it will only be expressed if the individual is homozygous for that allele, and is called homozygous recessive. While the external, observable expression of the genotype is called the phenotype. Phenotypic characteristics that fall into a limited number of discrete categories, such as the example of flower color, are referred to as qualitative traits. While phenotypic traits that have a continuous distribution, such as height or weight, are referred to as quantitative traits. The expression of most phenotypic traits is influenced by the environment. The ability of a genotype to give rise to different phenotypic expressions under different environmental conditions is termed phenotypic plasticity. The set of phenotypes expressed by a single genotype across a range of environmental conditions is referred to as the norm of reaction. Developmental plasticity are changes that are irreversible. Example is when an adult plant develops, the patterns of biomass allocation, like proportion of leaf, stem, and root will remain largely unchanged, regardless of any changes in the light environment. The reversible phenotypic changes in an individual organism in response to changing environmental conditions are referred to as acclimation. It is a common response in both plant and animal species involving adjustments relating to biochemical, physiological, morphological, and behavioral traits. The species you can see here is not a flower. It's actually a mantis. The Hymenatus coronatus is an insect that has evolved in order to adapt to their environment. It's not the typical camouflage you see in other animals. They become like orchids in order to attract bees, thus an easier way of getting food. As you can see here, they have evolved from the common green mantis in order to adapt to an environment where they may prevail among other insects who does not have the phenotype of having an orchid-like appearance. Given this, we can see that the adaptation is a product of evolution by natural selection. In order to understand this further, we must first learn how genetic variation is organized within a population. Genetic variation is the naturally occurring genetic differences among individuals of the same species. This, therefore, permits the survival and flexibility of the species. This can be quantified in many ways, but the most fundamental are allele and gene frequencies. The sum of genetic information or alleles across all individuals in the population is referred to as the gene pool. So how can we say that adaptation is a product of evolution via natural selection? We go now to the work of Peter and Rosemary Grant, which provide an excellent documented example of natural selection. They have spent more than three decades in Daphne Major, Galapagos region, wherein they have recorded the dramatic shifts of physical characteristics of finches brought by extreme climate change. The phenotypic trait that selection acts directly upon is referred to as the target of selection. In this example, it is the beak size. The selective agent is the environmental cause of fitness differences among organisms with different phenotypes, or in this case, the change in food resources. It can be seen in this graph that the beaks of the finches vary from 8 mm to somewhere between 11 to 12 mm. However, due to the severe drought caused by climate change affected the thickness hardness and as well as the abundance of seeds across the island. 
As you can see in the two graphs, the seed abundance have declined and the seed depth hardness index have increased from the years 1975 to 1978. Proportional to the decline of abundance of seeds is the decrease of the number of flinches across the island. This graph shows that a large number of flinches having beak sizes of 10 to 11 millimeters have survived the scarcity of food. Adding all the information together, the increased survival rate of individuals with larger beaks resulted in a shift in the distribution of beak sizes in the population as seen in the graphs. This is a very good example of a directional selection in which the mean value of the trait is shifted toward one extreme over another. Another type of selection, known as disruptive selection, occurs when members of a population are subject to different selection pressures. In other cases, natural selection may favor individuals near the population mean at the expense of two extremes. This is referred to as stabilizing selection. Natural selection is not the only process that can function to alter patterns of genetic variation within. This may be a random force in evolution known as mutation, or the process of altering a gene or chromosome as well as with the product, the altered state of the gene or chromosome. This may also result in genetic drift, which is a chance in an allele frequency as a result. Another factor is migration, which is defined as the movement of individuals between local populations, whereas gene flow is the movement of genes between populations. Another factor is assorted mating, wherein individuals choose mates non-randomly with respect to their genotype, or more specifically, select mates based on some phenotypic traits. Assorted mating may be negative when mates are phenotypically less similar to each other than expected by chance. On the other hand, assorted mating is positive when mates are phenotypically more similar to each other than expected by chance. A special case of non-random mating is inbreeding, wherein the mating of individuals in the population that are more closely related than expected. Inbreeding can be detrimental. Offsprings are more likely to inherit rare, recessive, deleterious genes. These genes can cause decreased fertility, loss of vigor, reduced fitness, and even death. These consequences are referred to as inbreeding depression. Lastly, one of the most important principles of genetics is the Hardy-Weinberg principle, wherein no evolutionary change occurs through the process of sexual reproduction itself. The Hardy-Weinberg principle states that both allele and genotype frequencies will remain the same in successive generations of a sexually reproducing population if certain criteria are met. The first is that mating should be random. In this example, the man has no preference as regards to the color of the hair of the woman. The second condition is that mutations should not occur in the population. The third is that the population must be large enough that genetic drift is not an issue. The fourth is that there should be no migration in or out of the population. And the fifth and last condition is that natural selection does not occur. Under these conditions, all of the alleles have an equal chance of being passed down to the next generation. The mathematical demonstration of the Hardy-Weinberg principle is as follows. For example, we have two alleles occupying a locus, which is uppercase A and lowercase A. The frequencies of these two alleles could be symbolized by a lowercase p and lowercase q, respectively. Um, as frequencies, small letter p and small letter q have to equal to 1. Given the following alleles, we know that we can form three genotypes. The first one is a homozygous dominant, the second a heterozygous, and the third a homozygous recessive. The frequencies for these three genotypes could be symbolized by the uppercase letters P, H, and Q, respectively. Again, as frequencies, P, H, and Q sum to 1. If we are given the genotypic frequencies of a certain population, we can calculate the allele frequencies. Note again that P is the frequency of the homozygous dominant, H is for the heterozygous, and Q is for the homozygous recessive. To calculate lowercase p, we add the uppercase p to h divided by 2. We divide h by 2 
because H represents the heterozygous genotype and the heterozygous genotype only has one copy of the uppercase A allele. The same goes for lowercase q, which represents the frequency of the lowercase a allele. We also divide h over 2 because the heterozygous genotype has only one copy of the lowercase a allele. With a population consisting of the three genotypes that we just mentioned, there are six possible types of mating. For example, for the mating of two homozygous dominant organisms, there's only one way to go about it, which is a dominant female and a dominant male. Thus, the frequency of mating is just p times p, or p squared. For the second type of mating, which is a homozygous dominant and a heterozygous organism, you could have it two ways. You could have the dominant be a female and the heterozygous one be a male, or the other way around. Thus, the proper frequency of mating could be p times h multiplied by h times p. The others follow the same pattern, and from these, you can actually calculate the frequency of mating by just substituting p, h, and q by the values. And again, remember that all these should total to 1. Next, we need to determine the proportion of offspring genotypes produced by each mating combination. For two homozygous dominant individuals, the probability of getting a homozygous dominant individual as an offspring is 1. For a homozygous dominant and heterozygous organism that mated, the probability of getting a homozygous dominant individual as an offspring is 0.5 and the probability of getting a heterozygote is 0.5. For a homozygous dominant and a homozygous recessive mating, uh, the probability of their offspring being heterozygotes is 1. For a heterozygote and heterozygote mating, the probability of getting a homozygous dominant offspring is 0.25. The probability of getting a heterozygote is 0.5 and the probability of getting a homozygous recessive is 0.25. For a heterozygote that mated with a homozygous recessive individual, their offspring would have a proportion of 0.5 as heterozygotes and 0.5 as homozygous recessive. And for two homozygous recessive individuals who have mated all of their children with a proportion of 1 would be homozygous recessive. The frequency of mating that was obtained a while ago can be multiplied with the proportions in order to get the offspring frequencies per mating combination. Now, the offspring frequencies with the same genotype can be added together so as to get the genotype frequencies. These genotype frequencies represented by P, H, and Q prime can be used to calculate the allele frequencies of the offspring, which is lowercase p and lowercase q prime. Lowercase p prime is calculated as 0 0.8 and lowercase q prime is calculated as 0 0.2. Upon careful observation, one can note that the allele frequencies of the offspring, 0 0.8 and 0 0.2, are exactly the same as the parental allele frequencies. Also, the offspring's genotype frequencies are identical as the parental genotype frequencies, thus proving the Hardy-Weinberg law. In reality, the Hardy-Weinberg principle does not usually apply. The conditions that the Hardy-Weinberg principle assumes to be true are usually not viable in real life. All of these, especially natural selection, leads to a change in genetic variation. Natural selection can also alter the genetic variation among local populations as a result of local differences in environmental conditions. This phenomenon is known as genetic differentiation. When a species has a wide geographic distribution, they encounter a wider range of environmental conditions which they need to adapt to. This variation in environmental conditions can in turn result in a corresponding variation in phenotypes. The change in phenotype reflects the changing nature of natural selection under each of these localities. Certain traits that may be advantageous in one area might actually reduce the organism's fitness in the environmental conditions of another locality. To demonstrate 
let's say that there are three different populations of a certain species living in the United States. The first population resides in California and thus needs to deal with the shrubland type of environment, also known as the chaparral. The second population lives in Oregon and it has to deal with a temperate forest type of environment. The third population lives in Kansas and thus it has to deal with a grassland type of environment. Each of these environments or biomes would have different conditions which the populations have to adapt to. The geographic variation within the species in response to these changes may result in the evolution of clients' ecotypes and geographic isolates or subspecies. Clients are gradual changes in the phenotype along an environmental gradient. Clients are usually associated with an environmental gradient that varies in a continuous manner across the landscape. In this example, the differentiation in stature among yarrow plant populations in the Sierra Nevada is associated with the elevation in which these populations occur. As can be seen in this graph, as the elevation in which the population occur increases, the size or stature of the plants actually decrease. Continuous variation in the phenotype across the distribution results from gene flow from one population to another along the gradient. This gene flow is attributed to interbreeding between populations. As can be seen in this example, the proportion of cyanide-producing clovers increases gradually along a gradient from colder to milder winters. However, you cannot see a sudden marked discontinuity between the cyanide-producing and the non-cyanide-producing plants. Because of environmental constraints, any one population along the gradient will differ genetically to some degree from another, their difference increasing with the distance between populations. If one compares the clover populations of the areas with the mildest winters to those in the coldest winters, their difference is greater than when one compares them to those in the intermediate areas. In the study of Idel Cooper in 2010, it was determined that clinal variation exists in the sexual dimorphism in the body coloration of the Hawaiian damselfly Megalagron califia. These damselflies exhibit female limited color dimorphism. Males and andromorphs, which are females who have the same coloration as males, are red, while gymnomorphs, which are females that exhibit the right female coloration are green. The species distribution ranges from 650 to 2,025 meters in elevation on the island of Hawaii. Males defend territories in aquatic areas with open canopies along the elevational gradient. Female habitats are typically away from the mating site except during the act of mating itself and ovipositing at the stream bed. In this species, the variation in female color morph frequency over an elevational gradient results in a continuum of sexual dimorphism. As we can see, as the elevation increases, the andromorph frequency or the frequency of the females who are colored red just like the males increases. So red females and red males at high elevations make up populations that are sexually monomorphic while populations at low levels are sexually dimorphic with green females or gymnomorphs and red males. Mid-elevation populations contain a female-limited dimorphism with both female color morphs. In this figure, we can see that both males and andromorphs tend to become redder in hue at the higher elevations. An adaptive function of the excess red pigment may be as an antioxidant, which would help protect the insect from free radicals. An alternative explanation is that the red pigmentation acts as a physical barrier to UV light. Thus, the greater pigment concentration is beneficial under high solar radiation. In this figure, we can see that in the lower elevations, males are living in habitats that are usually exposed, while females usually live in shaded areas. But in higher elevations, both male and female habitats are actually exposed to sunlight. Again, this could be one reason as to why the females tend to become more andromorphic or more red as the elevation rises. This graph shows andromorph frequency over daily variation and solar radiation at one particular mid-elevation population. The proportion of females at this particular site that are andromorphic is higher under greater solar radiation. 
again, this supports the data that under greater amounts of sunlight, the insects, especially the females in particular, tend to become redder and that this red pigment may help make them more fit in areas with more solar radiation. Clinal variation may show marked discontinuities. Such abrupt changes or step lines often reflect abrupt changes in local environments. Such variants are called ecotypes. An ecotype is a population adapted to its unique local environmental conditions. Cyperus rotundus is a problematic weed in lowland rice grown in rotation with vegetables in the Philippines. The growth of C. rotundus is normally suppressed by prolonged flooding. Thus, the ability of this plant to grow in flooded as well as in upland conditions suggests that ecotypes occur. The study of Peña Fronteras et al. in 2008 determined that this was indeed the case here in the Philippines. It was discovered that Cyperus rotundus has two ecotypes, an upland ecotype and a lowland ecotype that was actually adapted to flooding. In flooding conditions, there is usually less oxygen, thus a condition of hypoxia. It was discovered that the lowland ecotype has larger tubers, providing greater storage for carbohydrates. This could be an important adaptation in which more energy resources are needed as it floods and metabolism needs to shift towards the less efficient anaerobic respiration. Lowland tubers also contain more total non-structural carbohydrates than upland tubers. They mostly store them in the form of soluble sugar reserves which are readily available as substrates for anaerobic respiration. In contrast, upland tubers store carbohydrates as starch. The decrease in the amounts of soluble sugars in lowland tubers upon germination and during hypoxia suggests that catabolism of soluble sugar is active. This indicates a pronounced pasteur effect in lowland tubers when oxygen is limited. A slow decrease in soluble sugars after 48 hours of hypoxia suggests that the use of soluble sugars by lowland ecotypes is highly regulated during hypoxia such that a steady state sugar level in lowland tubers is sustained. Higher levels of amylase activity in lowland tubers than in upland tubers before and during germination probably help in maintaining a high concentration of soluble sugars in lowland tubers which will ensure a constant supply of soluble sugars to fuel the ethanol fermentation pathway. Finally, the data showed that both C. rotundus ecotypes can induce alcohol dehydrogenase and pyruvate decarboxylase activities when experiencing hypoxic stress. Activities of both enzymes in lowland seedlings were substantially higher in germinated tubers after 24 hours under hypoxia but subsequently leveled out. However, activities in upland seedlings were lower earlier but increased progressively with time and were either similar or greater than those of lowland ecotypes after 48 hours of hypoxia. This increase in enzyme activities, presumably coupled with parallel increase in anaerobic respiration, could result in early exhaustion of energy resources, particularly soluble sugars in upland ecotypes. The responses in ADH and PDC activities indicate that lowland C. rotundus downregulates the rate of ethanol fermentation following increased enzyme activities after 24 hours of hypoxia. This could be in order to optimize the use of available carbohydrates as an adaptive mechanism to germinate and thrive under flooded conditions. The leveling off of ADH and PDC activities in roots, coupled with high amounts of soluble sugar and high amylase activity in tubers, ensures enough supply of soluble sugars for a longer duration to allow seedlings to survive and grow to the surface of flooded rice fields. This probably enables lowland C. rotundus to avoid depletion of substrates and energy resources during long periods of exposure to oxygen deficiency. This last example was added to show that the phenotypic variation can also be behavioral in nature, aside from the physiological and morphological differences that were demonstrated a while ago. In the study of Foster in 1999, it was shown that different populations of gasterosteus have different behaviors depending on the, popul the population's habitat. 
Well, populations that live in shallow eutrophic lakes often feed on benthic prey, and as they forage, they form groups which cannibalize the younger members of the population. Now, organisms or populations that live in deep oligotrophic lakes, of course, have less benthic prey to feed on, and thus they feed on planktonic prey. As a result, the groups, the foraging groups that actually cannibalize the younger members of the population, are lost. Now, ecotypes typically represent distinct genetic populations. However, gene flow occurs to varying degrees between adjacent populations. In some cases, however, geographic features such as rivers or mountain ranges can impede the movement of individuals, restricting gene flow between adjacent populations. These subpopulations make up geographic isolates. And these geographic isolates are often classified as subspecies. Have you ever wondered what the differences were between bonobo monkeys, seen here, and chimpanzees? Actually, they are very close relatives. In this figure taken from the study of Hay in 2009, we can see that what we commonly know as chimpanzees is actually made up of four subspecies. Aside from that, the chimpanzees are also of the same genus as the bonobo. The distribution of these subspecies is separated by geographical features like rivers. These subspecies formed when certain populations of the chimpanzees were isolated from one another and through time diverged from each other. In the case of the bonobo, the divergence was great enough that it was considered to be another species entirely. The speciation of the bonobo is an example of allopatric speciation, which occurs when populations of the same species become isolated from each other to an extent that it almost completely prevents or interferes with genetic interchange. The distance between the islands meant that the finches on different islands could not interbreed, so the populations on the different islands tended to become distinct. Different populations also became specialized for different food sources, birds with keen, sharp beaks eating insects and birds with large, sturdy beaks eating nuts. Charles Darwin went to the Galapagos Island and noticed differences in the finches. He studied 4 out of 15 finches. The finches went to different islands. With the different food sources, they evolved different beaks that were best for eating food on the island. They started out with the beaks good for seeds, then went off into leaves, insects, fruits, and grubs. All finches adapted to their island and brought up the reproduction rate since they weren't all fighting for the same food. The finches' beaks adapted to the food source, which was favored by natural selection. The successful finches that had the most useful beak for their island survived and therefore reproduced. This made them the more successful finches, which means their offspring would inherit their beak. Some of the finches were better able to survive because of their beak. For example, the short beak ground finch, also known as the vampire finch, would survive better than the mangrove finches on the wolf island. This is because on the wolf island, there are red-footed boobies and masked boobies, which the vampire finch uses its beak to feed from their blood. And in essence, all of this boils down to the fact that adaptations to one particular environment represents trade-offs and constraints. The fitness of any phenotype depends on the prevailing environmental conditions in the organism's habitat. The characteristics that increase the fitness of an organism in one set of conditions may decrease its fitness in another set of conditions. Aside from that, the earlier example of Darwin's ground finches shows how natural selection operates at three levels, within a population, among subpopulation, and among different species. During the period of drought, in the island of Daphne Major, the mean beak size of the local population of medium ground finches increased in response to the shift in abundance and quality of seed resources. Natural selection has also resulted in different mean beak size between populations of the medium ground finch in the island of Daphne Major and Santa Cruz. The larger mean beak size for the population of medium ground finches on Santa Cruz is due to competition from the population of small ground finch present in that island. The presence of the smaller species makes smaller seeds less available and thus increases the fitness of medium ground finches with larger beaks. This influence also works the other way around, causing the population of small ground finch in Santa Cruz to have smaller mean beak size. The character displacement between the two species occurs 
and the distribution of beak sizes for these specimens do not overlap. In contrast, on the islands of Daphne Major and Los Hermanos, the two species do not co-occur. Thus, the distribution for beak sizes for these two species in these islands is intermediate and overlapping.